It's tough when you're supposed to give a talk to be speechless. I'd rather listen to that testimony for the next hour than listen to me. I've heard me before. (laughs) When I was invited to this conference, I had no idea what it was going to be like. It's different than I expected. I was raised on the holy duet. Believe in the Father, Son, I watch out for the charismatics. (laughs) You guys believe in the Holy Spirit, do you? Holy Spirit, open my soul to places that you haven't yet reached because I'm too stubborn to let you in. And if you don't speak in me and through me, I'd just rather go home and sulk. But you're faithful, and I'm available for your purposes in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I have come to believe in the Holy Spirit in some new ways. My younger son... About 12 years ago, his wife left him, broke his heart. He didn't tell me until later that for six months he kept a loaded gun by his side, hoping to get the courage to blow his brains out. And after his divorce, which he didn't want, he was very, very disturbed by it, obviously. He said to me one day, Dad, I've just got enough money saved. I'm going to go halfway across the world, and I'm going to spend a week And I'm looking for God, and if I don't find him in a way I don't know him now, I'm not going to make it. So I told him as his dad and my wife Rachel, his mom, we said, we're going to pray for you every day. And I said, my commitment to you, at the very least, is going to be a lot more than this, but every day I'm going to pray for you for at least 15 minutes. I'm going to devote 15 minutes a day and a whole lot more, but that's my minimum commitment to you. And while he was gone for 10 days, actually, I prayed every day for much longer than 15 minutes. On a Saturday... About seven days of his 10-day trip were up, and I was praying. I was driving from Denver, where I lived down to Colorado Springs, to do a conference down there, and I just found myself wanting to pray for Kenny. I tell this story with his permission, of course. And have you ever, have you ever gotten bored when you prayed? A couple of you are going like this. Yeah. Well, I was praying a sing-song prayer. Dear Lord, uh, bless Ken. I had the radio on, didn't like the station, so I changed it. Lord, bless Ken, let me see if I can find something here. (laughs) And after a few minutes, I realized how pathetic that was, so I turned the radio off, and I said, what is really in me, what's alive in me that I want to pray? And and I found myself just thinking thinking of three songs, and I began to sing these songs as prayers, and the first song I sang, I was in tears this morning when we sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness, that was my first song. I was raised in a Christian home, I know all 10 verses, so I sang them all. (laughs) And my prayer was, Lord, may my son be able to say that you're faithful even though you could have arranged for him to never have met that particular girl. And you allowed that to happen knowing what was ahead for him and knowing the despair and the heartache and the devastation he was going to experience. God, what does it mean for you to be faithful? I'm not sure if I know, but I want to know and I want him to know. That was the first song that I sang over and over again. And secondly, I sang that simple little chorus, I love you, Lord. You all know that? I love you, Lord. And I, you know. And I sang that and I said, may my son be able to sing that. And then I sang what has become the Crab Family song, It Is Well With My Soul. May he be able to sing, it's well with my soul in the middle of what's going on. So I sang that for probably 45 minutes. I pulled the car to the side of the road. I was crying so hard I couldn't drive and wiped my eyes finally and finished my songs. And a couple days later, Kenny came back to Cleveland where he lives. My wife and I flew out to be with him very quickly, as you might expect. And as we sat down for lunch after he just got back from his trip, I said, Kenny, I got to tell you about a prayer experience I had last Saturday. I told him what I just told you, and Kenny sat up and he said, when did you pray that? I said, it was Saturday, about, what time, Dad? Oh, about 11.30 maybe, till about 12.15, and he went, oh my goodness. And I said, oh my goodness, what? (laughs) And he said, that was the first day that I had the courage 
to not occupy myself with reading or surfing or watching television. And during the time you were praying, I had the courage to finally go for a walk on the beach for three hours. And for three hours, I couldn't stop singing three songs. (laughs) Hound Dog, Jailhouse Rock, and Don't Be Cruel. (laughs) No, it was great as my faithfulness. I love you, Lord. And it is well with my soul. Maybe there is a Holy Spirit. Let me give you a little, um, little testimony myself before I get into what I want to say. And I just lost track of my time. What time do I stop? Tell me what time I stop. I've got to look at the calendar here. Ten, ten. All right. I became a Christian when I was eight years old. It was a boys' camp, and about 60 of us one night were sitting around a campfire, and the flames were rising high into the air, 20-foot flames. The heat was incredible. We were all at a distance. The counselor got up, and he said, boys, I want you to look into the fire. So I did. The counselor said, boys, you have a choice to make. Either trust Jesus or burn in the fires of hell forever. <laughs> That was a (laughs) no-brainer. So I trusted Jesus that night. (laughs) I don't want to go to hell. But let me tell you this, I had no idea what Jesus could mean in my life. All I knew was I had fire insurance. That's all I knew. When I got into teenage years, I was struggling with a number of things. Pimples. Stuttering, I was a very bad stutterer. I did my doctoral dissertation on stuttering to try to figure myself out. That's why most folks go into psychology, figure themselves out. (laughs) And hormones were kicking in. And Christianity as I knew it was not speaking to any of my private struggles. And so I abandoned Christianity when I began graduate school. I wrote to my father, a very strong Christian man, wonderful mentor of mine in so many significant ways, and I wrote to Dad, and I said, Dad, when I was away at University of Illinois beginning my doctoral program in clinical psych, and I said, Dad, i got to let you know something. As of now, I believe nothing, and I'm open to anything. He wrote back, I'm sure with much prayer, and he said, Dear Larry, he said three words, glad you're thinking. That released me. Now I wasn't fighting against something, I was searching for something. And after five years of graduate school, I realized psychology wasn't dealing with the core issues of life. And I gave God a second chance. I'm sure he was grateful. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted something that was going to speak into the real struggles of my life. By this point, I was married. I married Rachel, a girl that we met when we were 10 years old. I couldn't begin dating her then, of course. She was going to study with Carl. And when, (laughs) it's a true story, when she broke up with Carl at age 12, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, um, I stepped into her life and uh, we got married. I have a clue what it meant to be married. All I knew was that as I stood next to Rachel 48 years ago, just last week, I had no idea because she hadn't told me 21 years old, that she had been sexually abused for four years, ages 8 to 12. She had no idea about my struggles, how inadequate I felt, how stupid I felt, how out of sync I felt with my community. But I married her, didn't know what to do. Her maiden name was Rachel Joy Lankford. When she married me, she became Rachel Lankford Crab. So I took the joy out of her life and made her a crab. But I wanted so badly to to think through, to understand, to delve into, to make myself open to the reality of Christianity so I knew how to relate to this woman. I knew how to parent my kids as they came along. And I, I worked really, really hard at this. I 
Every time I'm introduced to speak, I get nervous because I've had such weird introductions in my life. <laughs> Thank you for a non-weird introduction. Appreciate that. One guy introduced me some time ago and said, Dr. Crabb has a message that will not be heard until he's dead. <laughs> About four or five years ago, I was in Germany with Bill Hybels, Willow Creek Church, the mega church in Chicago. Most of you knew about that. And they had 9,000 Germans coming to this conference, and I was one of the speakers, and Bill got up to introduce me. And then it literally went this way. This is exactly what happened. He said some nice things about me, and then he said this. He said, um, I want you to know that Dr. Crabb is a complicated man, and people tend to resist what he has to say. And now here's Dr. Crabb. <laughs> So I got up and looked at 9,000 Germans with a translator, of course, and I said, I stand before you as a complicated man, and you sit before me prepared to resist everything I'm going to say. <laughs> Let me tell you one of the reasons I'm glad to be here today, because I don't feel complicated and you don't feel resistant, because I got some things I really would like to say to you today. I trust they're from the Lord. But to honor Bill Hybels and give you a complicated title to this talk, which will make no sense until I explain it, then it'll make probably less sense. If I had to give a cumbersome, wordy, complicated, way too long title for what I want to say for the next few minutes, it would be this. And this is too many words, I know it's a bad title. The route to freedom from gender confusion is relational holiness. Our hope for meaningful and God-honoring sexual restoration depends on understanding what relational holiness is and pursuing it, which, requ which requires that we understand and recognize and repent of relational sin and are drawn to the beauty of relational holiness fully revealed in Jesus. Let me see if I can unpack that a little bit. I turned 70 in about two weeks. And anybody that has any ears at all on them, whether you're 10 or 80, You've gone through a lot. I've gone through a lot. You've gone through a lot. And I'm hoping that what I'm going to be able to present for the next few minutes is going to be simple truth that survives complexity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great jurist, once put it this way. He said that um, I wouldn't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I'd give my right arm for simplicity on the far side of complexity. And what I want to present to you this morning are a couple of pretty simple thoughts that have survived complexity in my own history. For 62 years now, since I was saved at eight and I'm almost 70, for 62 years I've been, a, I've been forgiven by Jesus and a sometimes wavering follower of Jesus who to this day longs to more fully experience the freedom of Jesus. I'm forgiven, I'm a follower, and man, do I want to know freedom more than I know now. And after 45 years of counseling as a wounded healer, and teaching and writing as a searching thinker, I've concluded very simply, very obvious to all of you, I'm just talking to the choir here, three things about the Christian life. Number one, it's not easy. We're wrong to pretend that Jesus makes it easy to live and relate the way we're designed to relate, but he does make it desirable. Think about that. Not always easy to relate the way we're to relate. Let me tell you a quick little story. It happened about, oh, six months ago. The only reason I'm glad my wife is not here is when I say something like six months ago, I'm just making it up, I have no idea. <laughs> but, 
if Rachel were here, she'd say that was February 23rd at <laughs> two in the morning or something. So without fear of contradiction, six months ago, Rachel and I got home from a long day and we were both tired and we both plopped into our chairs after a little dinner. And Rachel didn't seem to realize that I was more tired than she was. <laughs> Normally a good wife, but she didn't. And so I'm, I'm sitting in my chair and I put the leg thing up, you know, and put the television on, thought I'd find some rerun of Castle or something just to waste time. I wanted to veg. Rachel got her computer out and was going to clean up her emails, and so she's sitting here, I'm sitting here, and just when I got the chair comfortable, I found a rerun of Castle, I was happy. Rachel, to nobody in particular, nobody was in the room except me, but she said out loud, looking forward, not even toward me, she said, this is a silly little story, but it makes a point. True story, too. She said, um, oh, I left my iced tea in the kitchen. Now, I'm a trained psychologist. <laughs> I could pick up her intent. And as silly as this sounds, it's true. At that moment, I could feel the flesh-spirit struggle going on within me between relational holiness and relational sin. Because I could sense one part of me saying, I'm going to hold her accountable. She forgot it. <laughs> That's my ministry to my wife. The other side of me, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He went to the cross and died for me. Maybe I could get out of my chair and get her iced tea. <laughs> and that little battle was going on in me for maybe five or six seconds. It really was. It happened just this way. And the Spirit of God won. Because I realized this is what I most wanted to do. So I got up cheerfully without grumping, without, oh, I'll get it for you. And I, <laughs> I said, I'll get it, honey. It took about five seconds, but I said, I'll get it, honey. And I went and got the iced tea and brought it back, and I gave it to her. You know, you know what she said? Oh, my. She said, thank you. That wasn't near enough. <laughs> How about a little promise of a little fun tonight or something, you know? I can't even be good without being bad. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Silly little story, but it's not easy to live in relational holiness. It requires daily repentance. Did you know that Martin Luther, when he began the Reformation, 95 Theses in the door of the Wittenberg door thing, you know what the first one was that began the Reformation and recovered justification by faith? First thing was our master desires that we live in daily brokenness and repentance. Over what? Over all the big sins? Well, I really haven't committed a lot of the big sins. But at that moment, there was a demanding spirit within me. Rachel ought to appreciate a little bit more than she does. She ought to fill my soul in a way she's not filling it, because God, you aren't doing that good of a job. Are we clear? How about some repentance over that ugly relational sin? It isn't easy to live the Christian life. That's the first thing I've concluded after... 62 years of following Jesus. Second thing I've concluded is the abundant life that's available in Jesus only comes to those who walk the narrow road to life. Amen. What's the narrow road? I'm writing a book on that right now. And I believe the narrow road is defined by an awareness of the flesh-spirit struggle within you, which is a relational struggle between relational holiness and relational sin. That's my second thing. Walk the narrow road or you're not going to know the abundant life. Third thing that's become clear to me, the abundant life that Jesus promises, and this is a bit redundant, but see if I can say it more clearly. The abundant life that Jesus promises has nothing to do with an easier life. It has everything to do with a loving life. Learning to put Jesus on display by the way we relate to each other. What did Jesus mean in John 17 when he was praying shortly before he went to the cross? And he said, Father, the glory you gave me, I've given them. So what? So they get all the blessings of a great job, great money, great health? No. I've given them the glory you've given, given me so they can be one like we are one. Talk about a high standard for oneness. 
having a community like the Trinity? They get along pretty well, have you noticed? The only small group in the history of time that's gotten along well. Now, with that simple little framework, life isn't easy. Walk the narrow road to life, and you'll discover the abundant life, and realize the abundant life is the power to love the way Jesus loves. With that framework, let me tell you um, three truths that as I thought about speaking to you today, I just felt to come alive within my soul. A verse that's meant a great deal to me over the past number of years, and particularly in the last few months, actually, 2 Timothy 3, 14, where the Apostle Paul, who's in jail in a very difficult dungeon, he was under house arrest in Rome earlier, but now he's in a dungeon in Rome and about to have his head chopped off, and he says to Timothy, follow me. Yeah, that's a good idea. Follow me and get in trouble like you're in trouble. And then he said, continue in what you've learned. Remember the second half of the verse? And have become convinced of. What have I become so convinced of after following Jesus now many times inconsistently for 62 years? What have I become so convinced of that nothing could dislodge the truth that I believe in my soul? What do I really believe? I want to share with you three truths that impressed himself in my soul as I was preparing for this talk this morning. Three truths that I'm willing to say I'm convinced of. Truth number one, let me just say them briefly and then discuss them a little more thoroughly in the time that's left. Truth number one, God's plan centers on, how would you finish that sentence? God's plan centers on every man and woman who follows Jesus learning to live increasingly and more and more fully alive as men and women. What's it mean to be fully alive in relational femininity? What's it mean to be fully alive in relational masculinity? Church father named Irenaeus in the second or third centuries He's very famous for one particular quote. He said, the glory of God is a human being made fully alive. And when I began thinking about that quote, which I read some years ago, and as I've been doing some teaching on things similar, I began to say, all right, he, he wants us to make us fully alive, but, but we're not just human beings, we're gendered human beings. So what's it mean to be fully alive in my masculinity? What's it mean for you to be fully alive in your femininity? And is there anything that the world has screwed up more than the answer to that question? That's truth number one. God's plan is centers on me becoming fully alive for the glory of God as a man. And you becoming fully alive for the glory of God as a man or a woman, truth number one. Truth number two, what most gets in the way of living fully alive for the glory of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, what most gets in the way of living fully alive is not compulsive, God-dishonoring sexual desire. It is chosen, God-rejecting relational sin. I'm not talking about sexual sin, but relational sin. What am I talking about? That's truth number two that I've been thinking about. Truth number three. This is a little hard to express. See if you can follow what I'm saying. I'm, I guess I am a complicated man. Truth number three, although effort is required, there's got to be discipline and choices made on the route to living fully alive as relationally feminine or relationally masculine women and men. Although effort is required, the key to living fully alive as men and women is to discover the deepest desire in every Christian's heart and to see that your deepest desire powerfully competes with every self-serving, people-using, sinful desire. Did you follow that? I didn't either. <laughs> Let me say it again. Although effort is required, I'll look at it more carefully in a minute. Although effort is required, the key to living fully alive and 
my relational masculinity and your relational femininity, what does it mean to be feminine? What does it mean to be masculine by biblical standards? The key to living fully alive in our masculinity or femininity is to discover the deepest desire in every Christian's heart that the Holy Spirit has put there. He's given us a new heart, Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31. He's given us a new heart that moves us to keep his decrees. That's how Ezekiel puts it. And can we discover, can we get in touch with the desire, the deepest desire in my heart as a Christian, it's deeper than any other desire, and to realize that that deepest desire that is mine because of the Holy Spirit powerfully competes with every wrong desire. You're not going to resist your wrong desire until you're more attracted to a different desire. An old Puritan named Thomas Chalmers, he talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. That's the third. Now, let's go back and see if I can complicate it more. Truth number one, we can increasingly live fully alive and as men and women only because of the gospel. It's not possible without the gospel. Now let me think about that with you for a few minutes. A little bit of Bible study here. Stuff that you all know, let me just repeat it. You go back to Genesis chapter one, the first creation story. Genesis two duplicates with some differences the creation story. And in Genesis one, Starting at verse 3 through verse 25, we're told that God made everything that is. And you know the formula, that's almost invariant, some little differences here and there, but the general feel for the first the verses 3 to 25 and all the things that he made, the sun, the moon, the planets, the, the trees, the birds, the fish, and all that, it said, God said, let there be, right? But then when he made me, and when he made you, the formula changes. He didn't say, let there be a human being. Adam, Adam, this means human being. It's not a gender, it's a gender neutral word, just human being. He didn't say, let there be human beings and let there be male human beings and female human beings. He didn't put it that way. Remember for the first time in Genesis 1.26, after having said, God said, let there be, now he said something very different. Remember what he said? Let us. It's the first hint of the Trinity. The relational community. They do get along well. And I want to know how they get along so well. Because how they get along defines relational holiness. And he made me as a dom, as a human being. We all share humanity. We're all human beings. And he made us to in, in the image of God, in the image of this relational God. There's a marvelous book by a very high-level author. It's a real chewy book. It's taken me years to get through it. By a guy named Stanley Grenz. It's called The Social God and the Relational Self. And its uh, subtitle is A Trinitarian Understanding of the Image of God. You bear the image of God. I bear the image of God. You all know that, but what on earth does it mean? C.S. Lewis puts it well when he says, you've never sat next to a mere mortal. The person you're sitting next to right now, if you could see them in their eternal state, either you couldn't bear the sight or you'd be tempted to worship. You shouldn't worship anybody but God, but if I saw my mother who died a miserable death of Alzheimer's, if I could see her today, I'd be tempted to worship. She's so gorgeous right now. We bear the image of a relational God. Therefore, we're designed to relate in a particular way. Let's make them, God said, amongst themselves, the Father, Son, and Spirit, coming up with a great idea. Let us make human beings, and everything God does, he does for what purpose? Answer? For his own glory. So let's make human beings for our glory. What does it mean to be human beings for his glory? It means that we are alive as human beings for the glory of God, meaning that we can reveal the way they relate amongst themselves, the beauty of their relational nature by the way we relate to each other. That's the glory that the Father gave the Son. He put, now listen to this, in the incarnation, the Father gave the Son, John 17, the Father just gave the Son the, 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 the duty, the calling, the privilege of putting deity on display in humanity. That's the incarnation. And then Jesus says, Father, you gave me that glory. 
I came and was born as, a, as an infant and from Mary's womb and the special virgin birth. And then as I developed as a little boy and, and got to be a young man and, and was killed at age 33, from, from zero to 33, I displayed the divine nature in a human being. Did you ever think of that? Did you ever think what it would have been like to, be, to see Jesus when he was a teenager? Did you ever meet a perfect teenager? <laughs> Jesus was. Our family, um, when they were little, my boys, we have two sons, now they're 46 as of yesterday, and 43, my younger son, who's now happily married to Leslie, we're very pleased with that, obviously. But when they were little, I took my responsibility as a father seriously to teach my kids the Bible. For family devotions, I purchased an overhead projector. We did Old Testament survey and New Testament survey. The kids just loved it. <laughs> Sometimes we had fun. One of our fun things was we'd act out biblical characters, and one of us would leave the room, Rachel or myself or Kepper Ken, would leave the room and come back in biblical character, and we had to guess who they were impersonating. Well, Kenny was about eight, and he left the room. He was going to come back in in character. We had no idea who. He was going to make it up. And he came back in, in character, and the way he illustrated the character he was impersonating went something like this, I hate being in this family. I'm always blamed for everything. They're my brother's fault. I get in trouble, and he never does. It makes no sense to me at all, and I hate it. It's just unfair. You had no idea who he was talking about. And he's finally, we gave up. Jesus, or Kenny, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus' brother. Son, you took the dollar off my, off my uh, bureau. No, 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 Jesus did it. Uh, no, son, he doesn't do, do that sort of thing. No. <laughs> Jesus put deity on display in humanity, and that's what I'm here to do. That's the purpose you're alive today. But then he goes on to say, and let's make them male and female for what reason? Folks, the central reason that he made us male and female is not marriage and procreation. That's part of it. But if that's the central reason, sorry, singles, you're out of luck. Oh, no, that's not true. The central reason he made male and female was each has a unique calling to relate in a particularly unique way that reveals something beautiful about divine relating. I'm going to look at this more in my breakout session, but just briefly, let me tell you this. The word for female... In Genesis 1, let's make them female, and the Hebrew is nekabah, and what it literally means, it's a word that if you look it up in your dictionaries that tell you the Hebrew into English translations, it's a word that literally means something that every woman in the room is not going to like when I first tell you. It means punctured, opened. But you know what it means? What it came to mean etymologically? Opened to receive. I believe the way your bodies are shaped, ladies, is a parable of the way your soul is shaped relationally. And the sexual act between men and woman, the woman is open to receive and invites strong movement into her most intimate parts. What's femininity? Open to receive. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, when Jesus was having a debate with the Pharisees about a number of matters that I won't consider now, but at one point, Jesus said to the Pharisees in response to their ridiculous questions, he said, didn't you ever read Genesis 1 where he made us male and female? And the word for female that he uses there in the Greek is telos, which literally is a word that means breast. And I take from that that relational femininity has a lot to do, maybe centrally to do, with a woman who relates in a way that is open to receive whatever advances the purposes of God and is supplied to nourish. That's the breast imagery. Everything that advances the purposes of God. What does it mean to be feminine? This is defined by your clothing or your shape or the pitch of your voice or your hairstyle. 
Peter makes that very clear in 1 Peter 3, talking to wives. He said, don't let your beauty be dependent on hairstyles or clothing or jewelry. Nothing's wrong with any of that, but it doesn't define femininity. Femininity is defined in relational ways. What does it mean to be open to receive and supply to nourish? I want to look at that more carefully in my breakout, but that's just a thought in passing. Fully alive in relational femininity. For a man, what's it mean to be, to be masculine? If a woman... If maybe one central word that gets at relational femininity is to be invitational, wired to invite others to enter them, to experience the deep beauty of God within them. I think that's one reason why I love my wife so much. She knows me as nobody else does and still wants me to come to her. Just like Jesus who said, come to me. All of you screwballs. And Rachel sees me in my weakness, my inadequacies, my fears, my failures. And she says, I'm here. Come. And I go, I think I will. <laughs> the word for male is the word zakar, and it literally means one who remembers and moves. Masculinity. What is relational masculinity? The degree to which you're relationally masculine is the degree to which you'll discover the power to resist inappropriate sexual connection. Whether it's homosexuality or pornography or adultery or anything else. Can I claim the privilege that I have as a man to reveal the moving nature of God who moved into our neighborhood? the way Peterson translates John 1. He moved into our neighborhood. He moved into the mess of our lives because he wanted to redeem the mess that's there. Do I know what it means to move into people's lives, my wife's in particular, my kids, my friends? Do I know what it means to move? Or, now listen carefully, you know, I'm so much more comfortable speaking to a group of people I'll probably never meet again. Because if you let me know what's really happening in your life, I might feel really inadequate and have no idea what to say. People used to pay me when I was in private practice to talk to them. The number of times, this this is very true, the number of times that I was in private practice as a therapist, under my breath, sometimes I would say, many, many times I would say, under my breath, this person needs professional help. What does it mean to move into another person's life, particularly into a into a wife's life, if you will? Let me tell you another silly story that makes a point. We were I was speaking at Moody Founders Week some years ago in downtown Chicago, and Rachel and I were at a hotel. We were in the 25th floor of our hotel, and we had agreed to meet some people, some friends of ours, in the lobby of the hotel at 5:30. And so we were in the hotel room, and we needed to leave the hotel room at about 5.25 to walk about 30 seconds down to the elevator, wait for two or three minutes for a crowded elevator to come and go down 25 floors and meet our friends at 5.30. We all knew, by all, I mean Rachel and I, knew that we needed to leave the room at 5.25. At 5.25, I was ready. (laughs) Rachel, however, was facing the mirror on the wall, I was sitting behind her, and she was doing things that just terrify an inadequate man who doesn't know how to remember and move. She was doing this. Oh, my hair's a mess. What does a relationally masculine man do at that moment? (laughs) Well, I thought of several options. One option might be to, I've tried it before. That looks fine to me, hon. So frustrating when I say something nice like that and it makes no impact. And she goes, it does not. And, and then she goes out in the hallway and the woman friend walks by and says, oh, your hair's cute. And she says, oh, really? I'm so glad. <laughs> so I knew saying that wasn't going to work. So I remember thinking to myself, maybe what I could say is, um, you got a point. Bag over the head night, my goodness. 
What I did end up saying, though, and this is actually a true story, I said, um, looks okay from the back. <laughs> Figured you couldn't argue with that. And <laughs> what you actually said, this is true, I'll tell you, this is true. What you actually said is, oh good, I'll walk around backwards all night. <laughs> Now, let me take that silly story and make the point. The point is the degree to which I feel like I don't have the weight to make an impact on somebody else's soul is the degree to which I'm subject and vulnerable to sexual disorder. Relational masculinity. God, you've given me the weight to move into somebody else's soul and to make a difference for your glory because of your power. Do I believe that? Fully alive in relational masculinity, relational femininity. Let me suggest this to you. Gender confusion begins with all the other things that happen in our backgrounds, but in the core of our soul that begins when women and men fail to relate in ways that uniquely reveal the beauty of the three divine persons of the Trinity who move toward us to make the deepest impact in our lives and who invite us into the joys of their incredible community. That's truth number one. Briefly now, truth number two. Nothing gets in the way of relational holiness more than unrecognized and unrepented of relational sin. What's the opposite of a woman being invitational? Maybe it's a woman controlling. Genesis 3.16, after Adam and Eve sinned, and God pronounced judgment on the two of them. The judgment to Eve was to her and her feminine physicalness and her feminine relationality. He said, you're going to have pain in childbirth. And then he said the second part of the judgment. Remember what it was? Your desire shall be for your husband. I remember being so puzzled by that. Rachel does desire me. That's part of the curse? I don't think so. So what's the text mean? Well, the word for desire there in Genesis 3.16 is a very unusual word in the Hebrew. It occurs only three times in the Bible. The second most significant time when it occurs is Genesis 4 when um, Cain was all upset because his offering wasn't accepted like Adam's, like, a, like a, a Abel's was. And God came to Cain and he said, sin is crouching at your door and it desires, the same word in Genesis 3.16, it desires to have mastery over you. There's a woman scholar from Westminster Seminary, Susan Foa, and she's written a book called Women in the Word of God, and she takes apart that particular word for desire with her scholarship, which I just read scholars, I'm not a scholar, and she said that what the word literally means is to take over and be in control of. Relational femininity. Come and enjoy the beauty of my soul. Relational sin. I'm taking over so you won't hurt me ever again, is that clear? And that gets in the way of restoration. And for a guy, rather than remembering and moving, we forget and retreat. Because we don't know what to do. I'm a whole lot better at writing books than I am in relating as a husband. That's why I write books about marriage. <laughs> Some years ago when I had finished one book, books get very consuming, and when I finished one book, I said to Rachel, after the one book was all finished and released. And I remember one night saying to her, honey, I had a great idea for a new book, and she began to cry. And I didn't know what to do, and I said something really clever, like, what are you crying about? That's at least my feeble effort to move into her soul. What's going on? I want to explore. I want to know who you are, but I'm scared to know all that you are because I might find out something I don't know what to do with. And what she said was, Larry, when you get involved in a book, I disappear from your existence. You see, men typically retreat from where we feel inadequate, like relating, and go to where we're competent. Maybe it's our business, maybe it's our sense of humor, maybe it's our sports ability, maybe it's our making money, whatever. Last thing I want to say, Truth number three. 
I don't believe we're ever gonna know the kind of restoration that God has in mind for each of us as gendered image bearers, whoever that genderness has gotten corrupted and messed up. We're never gonna know the fullness of the restoration that God has in mind for us as gendered image bearers until God's Spirit puts us in touch with the desire to reveal his beauty by how we relate. Have I been consumed by the beauty of the Trinity? Folks, the last 10 or 15 years, I've been consumed with Trinitarian theology. A mentor of mine is now with the Lord, president of a seminary in Australia, Sydney, where I lectured some years ago, got to know him. He has a book called The Everlasting God, and he says in that book, and he was considered the finest theological mind alive in his day, and he said the central truth of the Christian religion is the doctrine of the Trinity. Final reality is relationality. Every psychological problem that I've been trained to deal with, every emotional disorder, every gender difficulty that doesn't have an organic basis, some things do, that doesn't have an organic basis, certain depressions or uh, bipolar perhaps, but every problem, human problem, that doesn't have an organic basis has its roots in a failure of relationality. Women not being relationally feminine, closed rather than open. Men not being relationally masculine, backing away into where we're good as opposed to moving, trusting God's strength. One last illustration of this point, and then I'm going to quit. I've had cancer three times. First bout with cancer was 18 years ago. Then three years ago, another second surgery. And then four months ago, another procedure for liver cancer. First time I had cancer, first time I was diagnosed with cancer, I had been sick for about four years, undiagnosed. Then finally my doctor came up with a, a new um, way of diagnosing things that I'm sure none of you have heard of. It's very sophisticated finally gave me a CAT scan and they found a tumor the size of a tennis ball on my pancreas. Wow. And I was in the hospital awaiting surgery the next morning. Rachel and I were scared to death in so many ways. Rest wasn't our experience at the moment. But after Rachel had to leave, visiting hours were over and I was in the hospital bed at nine o'clock at night and waiting for surgery very shortly thereafter, the next day or so. And I got out of bed and I walked over to the window on the ninth floor of St. Joe's Hospital in downtown Denver, and I looked down and I saw a Starbucks. And I saw this about 9.15, 9.30 at night, and I saw a car pull up to Starbucks, and a couple about our age got out of the car and went into Starbucks. And they had come from this direction up here, Denver Theater District, and I thought, this is Saturday night, I wonder if they just read a wonderful play, and they're getting a little nightcap of a Starbucks decaf latte or something, and going to go home and maybe go to church the next morning. Oh, I remember thinking, I wish I were there as opposed to here. What's my deepest desire? At that point, what I'm aware of is not relationality. What I'm aware of is the blessing of good health and a good life. Isn't that the abundant life? No, it's not. The abundant life is the abundance of power and desire to love well. But I wasn't aware of that, and I'm thinking, oh, why am I happy up here? I got cancer, and they're down there having a good time, and I'm just, oh, I'm just not happy. And at that time, the Spirit of God brought to my mind a parable given by Augustine, the great church father from centuries ago. Augustine told this parable, and this is the final story I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to quit. Augustine said this, he said, suppose God came to you and said, Make a list of everything you want, every blessing you would love to have, legitimate things. A decent job, a good marriage, wonderful kids, um, good health. Make a list of everything you could possibly want on this piece of paper, Augustine said. Suppose God came to you and said, I'm telling you to make that list. Suppose God told you to make the list. And you went, oh, okay, there's my list. 
And then Augustine says, suppose God came to you and said, I will give you everything on your list on one condition. You will never see my face. And Augustine finishes the parable this way. The chill that you feel in your soul when you think of never being intimate with God, never having a relationship with God, to see his face, to know him deeply. The chill that you feel when you think of never seeing the face of God in Jesus Christ, literally one day, is, the chill is your love for God. And I remember looking down at that ninth floor, I said, Lord, if you were to say to me now, Larry, I'll have a doctor walk in in two minutes and tell you we misdiagnosed, you're totally healthy, go home. I'll give you that, but you'll never see my face. I became so aware that my soul wants him. And I said, Lord, do anything else you want. I just want to know you. Could we know what it means to know God? The Trinity, they're a party happening. <laughs> Could we learn to dance with the Trinity? Oh, folks, I told you at the beginning, I just was raised in a very subdued kind of a background. Worship meant... I remember I was preaching once at the Billy Graham Training Center, and my dad was in the audience some years ago, congregation. One of those nights where I was really anointed, uh, something really happened, it was really went well. And dad afterward, very conservative, very re sub subdued brother, he came to me afterward and he said, Larry, uh, the Lord spoke for you tonight. And then he looked around to make sure nobody was listening and he said, I almost raised my hands. <laughs> Could I become so enthralled with the beauty of the Trinity that my hands have to go up and say, God, this is unbelievable, and you want me to put you on display by the way that I relate? There's nothing I want more, and that's the root to restored hope. 